The Birthday Girl A Short Horror Story Written by Stories from the Attic Narrated by Robin McConnell For almost the first full year that I worked with Doris, I mistakenly referred to her as Dora. Not that this was entirely my fault, you understand. The name, printed on the rotor, which was itself neatly pinned to my clipboard on my first day, clearly said Dora. In fact, the rotor continued to insist upon incorrectly naming her for the entire time that I worked at the Marbrook Grove Retirement Home, even after I had realised the mistake and informed the office about it. Then, of course, there was Dora, or should I say Doris, herself. Of course, she had noticed almost immediately that I was referring to her by the wrong name, but never bothered to correct me. She, having decided that in the grand scheme of things Dora was close enough, found that it was actually amusing to watch me get it wrong every day for months. Rather than saying anything, Doris instead just played along, hoping to see how long it took me to realise my mistake. I remember it was a morning in April that I first realised, and even then it took a minute for the penny to drop. I had picked up Doris's mail from the central letterbox, which was basically a collection of pigeonholes just inside the main doors, with the numbers of each resident's flat on the top. The care staff, as we were known, would go each morning and pick up any mail that was sent to the residents under their care and take them to their individual flat. Just to explain, Marbrook Grove was what we in Britain call sheltered accommodation. It's basically an old folks home, but each resident has their own little warden-controlled flat. Each flat has a bedroom, living room, bathroom and kitchen to allow the resident a degree of independence, whilst also being under the same roof as other folks of the same age in a single retirement community. All of the flats have red emergency cords in every room for the residents to pull and call to the warden if they have any difficulties or need help. Some residents do live quite independently, especially at first, but as time goes on, the care staff are there to visit and help with things and look after people as their health and well-being deteriorates with age. Sometimes this would involve bathing or dressing the resident, other times it was cooking and cleaning for them, or attending to their personal needs with things like medication. When I first started at Marbrook, I had three residents directly under my care, a fella named Tom, a younger lass named Sue, whom I hardly saw, and Doris, who I thought was named Dora. Anyway, on the day I discovered my mistake, I had taken an unusually large crop of correspondence out from Doris's pigeonhole and had carried it to her flat for her morning visit. I usually dropped in on Doris three times a day to prepare her meals. Taking the additional letters meant carrying Doris's mail in two hands. Her delivery was always a large one because of all the papers. Usually the only thing in Doris's pigeonhole was the collection of daily news she had delivered every day. At least six different newspapers, every single day. On a Sunday, which this was, these papers came with additional inserts and supplements like magazines and TV guides, so carrying them all under one arm was somewhat difficult, especially when you had letters to carry as well. By the time I got to Doris's and plopped the pile of papers down onto the coffee table, I was a little flustered, having almost dropped the papers twice as I struggled to keep all the bumpf sandwiched inside where it was supposed to be. Wishing her good morning, I breezed into the kitchen to brew up some tea and told her she had a few letters. Lifting the first, something from the council about making sure she voted, I laughed and commented about how they had gotten her name mixed up. They've called you Doris on this one, I remember saying with a laugh. They want you to vote for them, but they can't even get your name right. Funny, isn't it? Doris smiled. She clearly found it very funny indeed. Turning over the second letter, which was in a lovely yellow envelope, I remember being surprised to see that the name on the front was again Doris. For a second I worried that I had picked up someone else's mail by mistake. Well, blow me, this one says Doris as well. That's not your real name. 
I was about to say, is it? But saw from Dora's toothy grin that I already had my answer. Your name is Doris? Doris, and you've been letting me call you Dora all this time? Doris only smiled. Not my fault you can't read proper, you balmy sod, she laughed. I wouldn't have told you at all. It were funnier watching you get it wrong. She laughed as I returned the smile and gently swatted at her with the yellow envelope. Fancy not letting on all that time, I said as she roared with laughter. Anyway, do you want me to read this to you or not? Doris wiped a tear from her eye. Are you sure it's for me? It's got some other bleeder's name on it. I shot her a withering look, hooked my finger under the fold of the envelope, and tore it open. As soon as the card came out, there was a sudden and abrupt change in Doris, as if a guillotine blade had fallen across the room, separating the light-hearted laughter that had been there just a few moments before from a deadly serious present. It's a birthday card. You never said it was. The card did read happy birthday on the front, though the inside was completely blank. It's not. It can't be. I mean, I've checked it and checked. What's the date? The date today. The date. She spat the words at me like daggers, jabbing and plunging their sharp points at me in her pressing haste for an answer. I... the twelfth, I think. Why? I replied, checking the date at the top of one of the newspapers. Doris clutched at her chest in relief, in a motion that for a second made me worry she might be having a heart attack. It's early, then. The card's early. Honestly, for a second there I thought I'd gotten it wrong. So it's not your birthday, then? Not yet, anyway. Doris looked away, turning her entire, tiny body to look out of the net-curtained window, and answered simply, No. Then she turned and out of nowhere told me to go. Listen, I can manage today. You've put the kettle on and I'm not hungry this morning. Come back at lunchtime. I don't need you here hovering about the place like a lost wasp. She raised both hands, fragile, with paper-thin skin and a protruding network of deep blue veins raised across the back to shoo me out of the door. And another thing. Today's Monday. I don't want anyone coming in here on Wednesday, OK? I looked at her, confused. Her sudden shifts in mood were concerning, but not as worrying as her suggestion that nobody come to see her. I'm not sure about that, Dora. Sorry, Doris. I've got rounds on Wednesday, and I'm down to see you three times that day, so I'll be here. Are you Mutton Jeff? Sorry? Deaf, cloth ears. Are you deaf? Doris asked aggressively. I've told you once, and I'll not tell you again. I don't want anyone, anyone at all, in this flat on Wednesday. Do you understand me? She tutted and adjusted the blanket she had draped over her knees. This is supposed to be independent living. Fair enough. For one day in the year, Wednesday, I want my bit of my own independence, all right? So nobody comes in. Just leave me be. I sighed and shrugged, knowing that this request was likely not going to go down well with management. Thing is, we need to give you your meals and... What? You can't just make me a batty the day before and put it in a fridge? Leave me some crackers or some crisps or something. Now I was beginning to become frustrated. Doris had never bristled up like this before, and, whilst her acting out of character was a little concerning and certainly something I would note on my end-of-shift report, her tone was also beginning to annoy me. Usually, Doris and I got on well. I often stayed for longer than scheduled in her flat, and over the course of almost twelve months, we had become very close— she had a wicked sense of humour, and we usually laughed a lot, more than with any of my other residents. In fact, it wouldn't be wrong to say that Doris was easily my favourite resident that I'd ever worked with. Now, though, she was being obstinate, belligerent, and not a little rude. I busied myself by carrying some of the dishes from the previous night's dinner into the kitchen adjoining where we were, and placed them in the sink. So just sandwiches the whole day, then? 
You're going to survive on that from morning till night, are you? I asked, with what I'll admit was a somewhat patronising tone. Yes, I bloody well will. I won't starve. And what kind of carer would I be if I left you with just that all day? They'll be ringing social services to report me at this rate. I smiled, trying to laugh off her suggestion and make something of a joke out of it, but the old woman was like a dog with a bone. She'd set her stubborn old mind to this, and now she was going to stick with it. Don't be so marred, she replied sternly. Wouldn't be the first time I've just had a butty for my tea. I'll be right. You make the sandwiches, bring them with you tomorrow, and that'll do me till Thursday. Nobody's going to be doing any complaining, any road. I've no family to do any complaining, not no more. Having washed and put away the plate and cutlery, I wandered back into the living room where Doris was sitting, as usual in her armchair by the window. Strolling over to her, I squatted at the coffee table she kept by her elbow, intending to retrieve her teacup and give it a rinse before I refreshed her tea. As I bent down, I tried, perhaps a little too flippantly, to overrule her and bring the ridiculous conversation to an end. Listen, I'm not leaving you with just sandwiches for a whole day, so you can forget it and I'll see you on Wednesday just the same as... Suddenly Doris lashed out, swiping at the teacup I'd come to collect with the back of her hand, sending cold tea spraying all over my uniform as the cup itself was sent hurtling across the room, where it smashed against the far wall. Listen to me, you daft cow. I've told you once and I'll not tell you again. You're not coming here on Wednesday, right? Not you, not the warden, not the Pope. Nobody. You understand? Nobody. This is my house and I say who comes in it. Straightening up and breathing deeply to control my emotions, I steadied myself and slowly but deliberately wiped the tea from my face and the front of my overalls. You want to be glad that wasn't hot or else? Or else? Doris spat in response. Or else what? Turning away, she waved me off with a flick of the wrist. Get out my sight. I don't want to see you. Well, I've still got... I began to protest. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out. She screeched, and, backing slowly toward the door, I left her there still fuming. As I left, I closed the door quietly behind me. As anyone who has worked in care will tell you, irrational and sometimes violent outbursts are par for the course when working with the elderly, particularly when working with those for whom dementia, senility, or some other form of diminished mental capacity is an issue. For Doris, as far as I knew, it wasn't an issue, and yet, over the course of a ten-minute conversation, my favourite service user had suddenly turned into a raving lunatic who didn't want me in her flat. I decided to see my other residents and then report the incident to the warden, a woman named Claire, with whom I had established quite a friendly working relationship. My intention wasn't to tell on Doris, but just to make the warden aware of what had happened and to record it, in case the incident was the first symptom of a problem and Doris would require some additional attention in the coming days, whether she wanted it or not. At the end of my shift I went to the warden's office to find that Claire wasn't there. Instead, another, younger woman named Bex informed me that she was taking over the call duty as Claire was out, and that if I had something to record I should put a record in the shift notes for the other carers and put it in the folder. Usually, though, there was another member of staff signed up to deliver Doris's tea. I would swap with them and take it down myself so I could spend a bit more time with her and so she had someone familiar coming in throughout the day. On that night, though, I decided against it. As Bex seemed far more interested in watching Love Island on her phone than she did in hearing about Doris's outburst, and since someone else had been rostered to sort Doris's evening meal that day, I decided to make the note in the log as suggested and speak to Claire about it personally the following day. Once I'd written up what had happened, I packed up my stuff and went home. No sooner had I gotten on the bus and taken my seat than my mobile rang. It was Priyanka, one of the other carers at the home. For a second I panicked. Priyanka would never usually call me during a shift, and I knew from my brief glance at the roster that she was scheduled to give Doris her meal that night. When I answered the phone, however, 
It wasn't Priyanka, but Doris on the other end of the line. She explained that she felt terrible about earlier, and that when I hadn't turned up to do her tea that night, she had asked Priyanka if she could borrow her phone to ring me. Listen, love, I'm sorry about before. I just... I get a bit wound up about birthdays, that's all. If you come see me tomorrow morning, I'll explain. I don't want you to go home with a cob on, all mad at me. She paused, and then with her voice lowered to an almost whisper, added, You're my favourite here. You know that. Hey! I could hear Priyanka braying in mock outrage. Oh, shush you. It's true. You're more like a daughter to me, and I feel terrible shouting at you. You know how it is. You always hurt the ones you love. I don't know if it was tiredness or something else, but I'll happily admit that those final words made me tear up a little. I'm sorry. Just come and see me tomorrow, will ya? I cleared my throat and said that I would, just as another voice broke in on the line. It was Priyanka, putting an end to the call before things got a bit too emotional. Right, you two, that's enough of the lovin'. She'll be here tomorrow, you can talk to her then. Whether I was meant to be the she or the her was not quite clear. I'm on pay as you go, this is costing me a fortune. And with that, she hung up. The following day, I went at the usual time to Doris's flat. I let myself in and was walking into the living room when I realised that she wasn't in her usual position in the armchair by the window. In the entire time I had been working with Doris, I had never arrived before she had made it to her chair, and could count on one hand the number of times I'd seen her leave it. For a moment I was worried, until I heard her call to me from the bedroom. When I entered I found her sitting in a straight-backed wooden chair. Before her on the bed that separated us were dozens of photographs, neatly laid out in rows. There looked to be around a hundred of them. The ones closer to me on my side of the bed were black and white or sepia-toned, whilst the ones closer to her were in colour. Every single one was a person, a portrait or a candid image, but always of a single individual. There were no family shots, no snaps of scenery or of group outings, most were only head shots. Scores of faces looked up from the bed at the beige expanse of the plastered ceiling, and now up at me. On my side of the bed there was a second wooden chair which had been set up directly opposite to where Doris was now sitting, with the bed between them. Why she had arranged them this way, as if she was having dinner across the surface of the bed with an invisible stranger seated opposite, I could not imagine. I decided not to mention the previous day's outburst and to just carry on as if nothing had happened. It was water under the bridge, anyhow. You sorting these into albums? Or just going through some old things? If you're arranging them, I can give you a lift sticking them in. I moved to approach her, in case she needed help getting around the double bed and into the living room, but she raised a hand as if to stop me. Then she pointed at the empty chair. For the first time I started to feel a little uneasy. Something in the way Doris commanded me to sit down, and the glaring, naked emptiness of that uninhabited seat, which seemed oddly to be more vacant than empty, gave me a shiver. It was early morning when I called, but Doris hadn't bothered to open the curtains. As such, the room was dim, with only a blank wash of pale light pressing half-blocked at the window. Sitting with her back to it, her iron-grey hair illuminated in such a way that it looked like a halo of electricity, Doris seemed oddly still, as if it weren't actually her, but a waxwork figure done up to look like her, sitting on the other side of the bed. It made me think of how people look after they die, when they're laid out at the chapel of rest, caked in makeup they would never normally have worn. Lying there, cold as marble, with all the life removed. I took a seat in the chair that had clearly been put out for me and waited expectantly. I'm going to tell you something now and I want you to listen. Don't say a word. You speak a single syllable and I'm going to stop talking and you'll never hear what I've got to say. Do you understand? I opened my mouth to say yes, but catching myself instead, 
nodded in response. Good. I've not told this to many other people, but I don't know, I felt bad about yesterday and... She trailed off, clearly feeling that one apology in a week was enough. Water under the bridge, I reminded myself. Well, I need to tell someone. These people, every single person you see here has three things in common. Firstly, they're all dead. Secondly, they all died on my birthday, April 14th. And finally, they all died on April 14th because I killed them. At first, I said nothing. I had seen residents lose their marbles before, but usually the marbles disappeared slowly from the bag, one by one. They didn't get poured out and arranged onto the bed as part of some murderous delusion. I opened my mouth to ask a question, but thought better of it and decided to listen instead. I don't mean I killed them, killed them, like with a knife or a lead pipe in the drawing room, but I did kill them because they're the ones I thought about. She paused and, raising one thin finger, pointed to the first photograph, a black and white image of a plump-looking woman with a very ancient-looking haircut. That's my Auntie Vi. She was an horrible woman. She used to babysit us when my parents were out and for the fun of it she'd give us the belt and send us to bed with nought to eat, just because she felt like it. When my mum and dad saw the bruises and asked what happened, we said we'd been play-fighting or we'd fallen over, but they put two and two together soon enough. Anyway, when I was nine, my mum gave us a massive cake for my birthday, with nine candles on it and everything. She had my aunties and uncles round, including Vi, and we had a sort of party. My mum asked Vi to carry the cake in from the kitchen, and somehow she managed to drop it. My mum had saved up to buy that cake, and it was the only thing I was getting for my birthday, so she was devastated for me. Obviously, as a little girl, I was gutted and all. Eventually, the bits that could be salvaged, what could be scraped up off the floor, were put on a saucer and put in front of me. I remember it was a big mush by then, but my auntie Vi put one candle in it, lit it, and told me to make a wish. In some ways, that was worse than just been in it. I remember looking at her, through her, right into the core of who she was, smiling at me with that horrible yellow-toothed grin and saying, Can I wish for anything? My auntie Vi had nodded and said it could be anything as long as I didn't tell anyone. It had to be a secret. As soon as she said that, I thought of all the times me and my brothers had had to keep a secret about her and her punishments. So I wished her dead. I blew out the candle and wished that she would die, and I didn't feel the least bit sad about it. I still don't. I remember thinking to myself, well, we'll see if this wish malarkey is really true, won't we? Doris paused and, for the first time since I'd entered the room, broke her fixed stare. Doing so, she seemed to soften, as if the wax she'd been composed of or covered in had begun to splinter and flake away, as if telling me just this part had been relief enough for her to soften. Taking a deep breath, she continued. That night she was hit by a car, which was odd because there wasn't many cars on the road back then, you had to be unlucky or a special type of stupid to get run over back then. She died before they could get her to hospital. I remember I was terrified, frightened out of my wits about what I'd done, what I at least thought I'd done. I mean, it could have been a coincidence, I suppose, but it certainly didn't feel that way to my little mind. I was scared out of my wits, but... Doris paused and, taking another deep breath to steady herself, fixed her eyes once again on mine. I was scared. I had every right to be. But I wasn't sorry. I never told anyone what I'd wished. I had nightmares sometimes that I did tell, and then the wish got reversed. It wouldn't stop her from being killed, it would just unmake the wish, and Vi would come back, all rotted and mouldering, to stand at the end of my bed, belt in her hand with maggots chewed through her cheeks. I worried about that, but I never said anything. After a few months, the fear just sort of went away. Nobody knew. I wasn't going to get caught or arrested or anything, so I just kept it to myself as a little secret. After a while, I stopped thinking about it as a bad deed altogether. In fact, I started to get excited about the next birthday. I know it sounds horrible and wrong, but every time someone annoyed me, treated me unfairly or punished me, I'd think about the birthday wish that was coming up, about this power that I had, and it made me feel excited. 
Wherever someone crossed me, even with the sort of trivial stuff that counts as a problem when you're nine, I'd think, be careful, mate, you don't know what I could do to you. The thought of it was, I don't know, it was good. I suppose you'd say intoxicating if you wanted to get all fancy about it, but obviously I didn't know that when I was nine. I just thought it made me strong, powerful. I thought the same when I turned ten. As she said this, I felt my eyes drawn to the second picture. It was an image of a young boy, no more than a teenager. Doris didn't explain. There was no account of his crime, what he had done to cross her, or why she had chosen to take vengeance. Only a nod. I was fifteen before the guilt started to set in. By that time I'd wished away five people. Killed them, just by blowing out a candle. By that point, though, I knew it wasn't a coincidence. It was a power I clearly had, and something I could choose to do if I wanted to. But I also realised that I wasn't obliged to, that I didn't have to wish for that. So, instead, that year, I wished that Arnold Parnell, the lad I had a crush on, would kiss me. Later that night at the pictures, he did. He was dead by the morning. Again, I leant forward in my chair, and only managed at the last second to resist the urge to ask a question. After that, I stopped wishing for a bit. I never even had a birthday cake. If I could help it and nobody found out, I'd skip my birthday altogether. Problem is, it doesn't help. I can't explain the logic of it. The later people aren't ones I had a grudge against, or even people I didn't like. Sometime in my mid-twenties I started to think that maybe it was someone I'd had bad thoughts about, or maybe the person I'd had the most bad thoughts about between birthdays, as if there was someone somewhere keeping score, like a tally. So then, I'd try having bad thoughts about really bad people, people I'd seen on the news and who probably deserved to die, but it didn't work like that. Later I started to think it was only people I knew personally, someone in my orbit, the closest I can get to applying logic is that it's someone that I've thought about that day, the day of my birthday. Now, the obvious answer is, well, make sure you don't think about anyone you love or who you like, but that doesn't work. Have you ever tried to not think about someone or something? If I say to you, don't think about orange penguins, what's the first thing that pops into your head? You can't help it. Through most of my thirties, I was mourning. People close to me, people I loved, they died, one by one, one a year. I didn't wish, didn't ask for it, and I tried my best not to think about them, but it was no use. I remember on my 40th birthday that the one brother I had still living pointed out the pattern, that people seemed to have passed away on my birthday for successive years. He said he'd noticed it years ago, but I'd never had the courage to mention it before. That's him there. She pointed to what I assumed was around the thirtieth photo. He died that night of a heart attack. In my forties I made it more deliberate. To start with, I thought I could save the people I loved if I focused my attention and just thought on one person. But then, like you say, that means pretty much selecting someone or picking them out for death. In the end, I decided if I was going to do that, I should do it proper. I had to be sure. So I bought myself a cake the right number of candles, and blew them all out in one go. I did that for twenty-five years, one a year, picking and choosing amongst my friends and acquaintances. It was horrible. Sometimes I tried to pick people I hardly knew because it wouldn't make me feel as bad, but then I worried that if they were too distant or too passing an acquaintance, you know, just someone you'd nod to on the bus but whose name you didn't really know, then it wouldn't work. I was scared that whoever it was that I wished to that first time, whoever I did my little deal with, would take one of my loved ones instead. So I was dead deliberate, calculated and cold. I had little notebooks where I would write notes to come up with my decision. Who was likely to live longest, who had the least friends or family would be hurt by their loss? One year, one year I really regret, I purposely went out with the intention of making a friend, I went out the day after my birthday to a church coffee morning, picked this one fellow from amongst the crowd and befriended him, knowing that as soon as he showed some interest and agreed to be my friend, he'd have just less than a year to live. I only did that once. I've tried knocking myself out on my birthday and all, 
drinking till I pass out or taking enough sleeping tablets to knock out a horse and sleeping right through the entire day. Problem is, when I do that, I dream. Then I've got no control. But last year, for the first time in seventy-odd years, nobody got hurt. So I'm at least going to try. You probably think I'm a horrible person, she muttered finally, raising herself to stand and waving me back into my seat when I instinctively began to rise to help her. You either don't believe me, or you do, and you think I'm horrible. I'll tell you, though. I used to say to myself that I'd never killed anyone who wasn't going to die eventually anyway. You never really save a life, you just prolong it and put off death. I chose the time, but I suppose nobody makes it out alive anyway, so where's the arm? You can hate me or judge me or whatever, but I've already been punished more than enough. I've lived with guilt for longer than I'd care to remember. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this, either way. Probably think I'm going balmy or that I've got dementia or something. Well, I haven't. I'm telling you for three reasons. Doris liked to break things into threes. First, because I had to tell someone. I just had to. It's been seventy-odd years and telling you feels like I'm having the weight lifted for the first time. Second, and this is the horrible one, because I can't guarantee it won't be you, unless I wish on someone else. I might, I might not. I've got a cake and a candle ready in case. Most likely I'll knock myself out and hope for the best, but I thought it was worth giving you fair warning in case... Well, in case you want to say any goodbyes on the off chance. She was half shuffling, half stumbling around the bed now, and had come to stand almost beside me. And in the end, more than anything, I just wanted you to know why I want to be left on my own tomorrow. Don't want to see or think about anyone. I think that's probably safest. Can you do that for me, please? Without saying a word, I reached into my bag and produced the three Tupperware boxes I had prepared for her. Breakfast, dinner, and tea, I said. Nobody's coming in on Wednesday. I've had a word with the warden, and she's fine with it as long as you promise to pull the cord if you need anything. Doris shuffled around to my side of the bed and, wrapping her hands around my entire head, pulled it close to her chest. I love you, you know. I mean that. I never had kids because, well, I couldn't risk it, could I? But you, darling, you're... I nodded that I understood. Then I watched as she shuffled into the living room. I followed her through, put the kettle on, and we continued the rest of the day as normal, as if the strange conversation had never even happened. That night I called both of my siblings and my parents just to let them know that I loved them. I tried to tell myself that I wasn't convinced by Doris's story, but I decided to call them anyway, just in case. The following morning I did my rounds with a different resident and never mentioned Doris once. When I came on shift the next day, it was as if a bomb had gone off. People were running around, frantically rushing from one place to the next, nobody stopping for a moment to clarify what was going on. Eventually, I managed to grab Priyanka by the arm and get some clarity. It's all gone off overnight, she said, shaking her head. Mr. Warboys in number 22 died in the night, so the people from the hospital and his family have been here all morning, and to add to that, your mate in number 19 has gone walkabout, just vanished like a bloody magician into a puff of smoke. God knows where she's gone or how she got out. Turning from her, I hurried toward Doris's flat. When I got there, the warden was standing outside and the door was wide open. Walking past her without saying a word, I looked first in the living room, then in the bedroom. The photographs were still there, though now, in the final place, there was a photograph of John Warboys. It was a portrait we'd had done the previous summer, and which had been taken down from the residence wall, frame and all, and placed on the bed. That was twelve years ago. The home never did locate Doris. The police were called and she was reported missing, but they had no joy. 
I told them the story she had told me, and whilst they tried to be polite, they couldn't help looking at me as if I should probably be under supervision myself. I never found out who sent the blank birthday card. I don't know if Doris knew who had sent it, or if she received a similar card every year. What I do know is this. In mid-April of last year I received a letter from a solicitor telling me that I had been named as the beneficiary in a will, and that I should come to his offices to discuss the last will and testament of Miss Doris Langdon. As the sole beneficiary, I don't mind saying that I came into quite a considerable sum of money. Within the will, which the solicitor read aloud in clipped dulcet tones, was a short note saying that I could claim the entire amount on my next birthday. "'Consider this,' the solicitor read. "'A birthday gift from... well, she's written Dora, but the whole thing is signed Doris, so I think she must have been a little confused toward the end,' he added, never spotting our private joke. When I said I had been unaware that Doris had such wealth behind her, the solicitor smiled, he explained that Doris had only herself come into the money a year ago. Apparently she had spent the last decade down south married to a man named Clive, who was extremely well off, and who had made her the sole beneficiary of his own will. It's strange, but Clive passed away almost a year to the day before she did. Come to think, it might actually have been the exact same day. When I asked if he knew anything of the circumstances surrounding Doris's death, he gave me a peculiar look, but finally explained that, It's all rather odd, really. She was found in her home, lying on top of a perfectly made bed, surrounded by photographs. They found her on the 15th or 16th, but it's likely that she actually passed away on what would have been her 100th birthday. Strange to say, but when they found her, she was holding a tiny little cupcake on her chest, with one single slightly melted candle sticking out of the top. It's an odd idea, but maybe a century was enough, and that going out that way was her birthday wish, he added dryly. Maybe you're right, I replied quietly. Maybe. This has been The Birthday Girl. A Short Horror Story Written by Stories from the Attic Narrated by Robin McConnell Copyright 2023 by Michael Vandervoort Production Copyright by Michael Vandervoort